Professor Peter Tofano is the Sylvan C. Coleman Professor of Financial Management at the Harvard Business School and serves as the school's Senior Associate Dean for Planning and University Affairs. He previously served as the Director of Faculty Development and as Head of the Finance Unit at the Harvard Business School. Uh, his interest is in the area of finance and uh, he has a fine scholarly record in that area. One of the interesting things about Professor Tofano's career is his willingness to branch out in areas that go beyond, in some sense, uh, the merely academic, the merely scholarly, to have an impact in the lives and hearts of uh, people who are not affiliated with the scholarly disciplines. One stream of his work is in the field of consumer finance, and part of his research focuses on how to leverage financial innovations to serve the financial service needs of the poor. He has uh, started his own nonprofit organization called Doorways to Dreams, or Do T Do, Do D to D, sorry, uh, get my vowels right, um, which is uh, exploring a number of possibilities to help low to moderate income people improve their situation financially. In addition to his fine work on many levels, including consultation in government and the business sector, uh, I've had a chance to interact with him uh, today and several times on the telephone. And he is a most gracious uh, human being and a, a wonderful colleague and uh, I can certify to you that his motives for all he do, all he does, are of the highest uh, character in terms of uh, morality, ethics, and commitment to people. Professor Tofano. Thank you, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's a busy day, and you probably have lots of other things, so I really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time out of your day to come join, join me and join us in this conversation. So I've studied many things over the years, uh, derivatives and financial engineering, but what's special about this one is that everybody in any audience I'm with can always understand this. So just to just get a sense, how many of you have credit cards? OK, how many of you have bank accounts? How many of you have invested in a mutual fund? How many of you, and maybe you can't really put up your hands, have ever had to pay an overdraft fee on it? OK, there's at least a couple honest people, a late fee on an account. Uh, maybe, OK, we don't need to, too much confessional here. What we're doing is we're studying where the financial system touches intimately every one of us. Um, it is true that the broader financial system, banks, um, equities markets, securities markets, are important elements of, the, of our system, our economic and social fabric. But this part of the social fabric, this where place of finance is especially important. So what we want to do is, what I'd like to do is spend the next hour telling you about a variety of research projects and, and educational programs and policy initiatives in the field of consumer finance. I want to encourage you to stop me along the way. I'm up here. There's a wall of beautiful wood separating me from you. But you know, really, let's make this as interactive as, as we can. So feel free to stick up your hands and ask questions and make comments as we go along. OK, fair? Because where I come from, that's, that's how we do things. Um, I would typically cold call you, but that's probably not sporting, uh, since I didn't warn you that that was going to happen. OK, so a little bit of sociology to start out. In the 19th and early 20th century, there were these two interesting academic initiatives that took place. If you look at business, the history of business schools, University-based business schools were really being formed really about 100, a little bit more than that. Wharton first and Harvard soon thereafter. So there were, at very elite uh, academic institutions, this, in, this drive to make business a reputable profession. And so my colleague, for example, Rakesh Karana, has written 
interesting book on this topic, but many others have as well. At the same time, and a little bit early, there was something called the Merrill Act, the Morrill Act, that basically set up land-grant universities. And the land-grant universities were charged under the legislation with teaching useful arts. And they became repositories for consumer science and, and, and personal finance topics. So if you play this forward 100 years, what you end up with is this interesting dichotomy where at schools like mine, household finance, consumer finance, really are non-topics. They are not part of the mainstream. They're not discussed. They're just not there. But yet, in the center of the country, at places like Ohio State's Consumer Science Department or in Texas and a bunch of other stuff, there's vibrant programs that study this stuff. Furthermore, there's tremendous gender differences. My professional association, the American Finance Association, has, and I might get the number a little bit off, about 80% men. The equivalent, the equivalent association for this other study of finance uh, is about 60-70% women. So what we have ended up with is this two centers of study. One that's studying finance at places like Harvard, and another that's studying personal finance at you know, and a bunch of other fine institutions, and they don't talk to one another. We read different journals, we go to different conferences, we hardly even interact. And in fact, there are these toxic words that can't be uttered in polite company, at least not in polite company where I come from. And those words are home ec. <laughs> right? You would never say to anybody, oh yeah, I'm a professor of home economics at Harvard University. So I am Harvard's home ec guy. <laughs> All right? Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, and the reason that's important is, and while I think about home economics, I think about it from a different level. This is the household sector in America. Um, this is the most recent numbers that from the from the from the federal government. The newest ones will come out later this week. So this is the household sector. The household sector in America controls sixty-eight trillion dollars worth of assets. Sixty-eight trillion dollars worth of assets. 23 trillion in tangible assets, 18 trillion in real estate, about 8 trillion in deposits. That includes both bank deposits and money market mutual funds. Credit market instruments, that's bonds, about 4 trillion in bonds, 8 trillion dollars in equities, uh, 4 trillion in money in mutual funds, excluding money market funds, 12 trillion in pensions, 6 trillion in unincorporated businesses. So if you think about it, these are big numbers. That's a trillion I'm talking about. Not a thousand, not a million, not a billion. A trillion dollars. And so when these things don't work, the economy has all kinds of problems. On the other side, um, there's about $14 trillion worth of consumer debt. Just out of curiosity, anybody here ever study like, corporate finance? I think we have at least one person who studies corporate finance. Is there more corporate debt in America or household debt in America? Corporate or household? Household, $14 trillion in household debt, $7 trillion in corporate debt. All right? These are big numbers. All right? And when little things happen like that, real estate number gets crunched by a trillion or so. You know, suddenly the economy is off the rails. All right? So it's not just about taking care of individuals one by one. Systemically, if you want to understand how the economy works, this sector has to be reckoned with. And right now, this sector is being watched intensively. These are just three articles from the last, I think, 10 days. Consumer credit in the US uh, fell to 3.6 billion, right? Credit defaults to 15 month lows. Personal saving rates climbed to one year high. This is household net worth in recessions. Um, and the red one is our current recession because you'll see that net worth has fallen and it hasn't recovered yet. Everybody's watching this sector because what we spend, what we save, whether we pay back our debts, has a first order impact on the speed of the recovery of the economy. So everybody's watching this. And furthermore, um, they're doing something about it. So this is the Dodd-Frank bill, which was signed into law relatively recently. Um, and while it's sometimes called the Dodd-Frank bill, it's interesting to look at the real title of the bill. Right? The short title, this act may be cited as the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. The world of regulation in Washington with respect to consumer protection is changing dramatically. We're about to have the first federal agency in Washington since the EPA, the first new federal agency in Washington since the EPA. And the reason we're doing this all is because households are not in particularly good shape. 
So um, I should have said this along the way. What a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about are a set of research papers. For example, that sociology thing, there's actually a paper that relates to that. This one is a paper as well. This is with Anna Lusardi and Danny Schneider. Um, and so we went out about a year ago in conjunction with a market research firm and polled a nationally representative sample of Americans. And among other questions, we asked this question. How confident are you that you could come up with $2,000 if an unexpected need arose within the next month? And kind of like the little engine could, right? I am certain I could. I probably could. I probably could not. I'm certain I could not. I don't know. Uh, so I won't ask you whether where you'd put yourselves. What fraction of Americans would say, I probably could not. I'm certain I could not. What do you think? What would be a guess? How many of you think 10% say probably or certainly could not? Let's, let's actually, everybody put your hands up, all right? And you'll take your hands down when I get to the point where you think I get to the right one. 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, okay. That pretty much brackets the landscape. The answer is, here's the United States. 46% of Americans say they certainly or probably couldn't come up with $2,000, and 7% say, I don't know. Now, this has come up with anyway. Friends, family, working more, savings, credit, anyway. And you might want to know how we compare to other countries. You know, we always pride ourselves as being you know, top of the world. Well, in this metric, unfortunately, we're not. So. What you see is that we're in good company with Mexico and the UK and Germany. Um, but countries, and some of you may have theories for why these work, like Italy with strong family networks. Um, they actually are doing much better. By the way, the number in European countries was 1,500 euros, which is roughly the same. Oh, why $2,000? Because that's what it would cost for an auto transmission. That's what it would cost for a, full, a set of full price airplane tickets if somebody got sick and you had to fly across country to take care of them. Um, kind of if you had a major, not major, but kind of a big dental expense, it could easily run into that range. Um, so this is not an arbitrary number. So about half of all Americans can't come up with $2,000 in 30 years. That's a pretty sobering thought. We then analyzed, um, and this is using US data, who is more or less likely to be able to cope. Um, and so for those of you who are more academically inclined, these are, if uh, in an analysis, uh, these are all put in at the same time, and these are marginal effects, as opposed to these are just univariate effects. So if you segment by wealth, people who are, and remember the, the base number is about 46. So if you see a number like 20, that means 46 plus about 20. It's not 20% more, it's 20 points more. So if you're in the higher wealth, higher top quartile, instead of it being 46, you get up to 21 plus another 36%. So it's pretty big impacts. People with higher income, sure. Um, separately controlling for income and wealth, people who are better educated. Remember, this is after controlling for income and wealth. Better education, 16 to 28% more. Older people, again, controlling for everything else. 15 to 29% more. People who claim they have a little financial education. That's an interesting one. So have you ever taken a course on finance or economics or anything? 20% um, more. And remember, that's after controlling for everything else. Everything else. Women, seven, per, seven points less. Unemployed, eight points less. Gamblers, seven points less. We're going to talk about gambling in a little bit. Um, People who lost a lot of assets, so not just about the level of assets, but the changes, 13 to 30% less able. Yes? That's exactly what it is. So that's the fraction of Americans who can cope conditional on these characteristics. Yeah. So in some sense, we're trying to figure out average level of fragility and then how it varies across different subpopulations. Now, how do you cope? There's no way you can read this. I can hardly read it. So I'll just have to tell you what it is. We gave them 14 different ways that they would go out in order to basically coping mechanisms. So the top coping mechanism, this one over here, 
not surprisingly, a savings. And I'm going to have to look here. 49% of people said that if, you know, for this $2,000, the first place they would turn is savings. We, gave, we allowed them to choose one if they only needed one or up to three if they needed three. The number two way, and this is good because you, unless your eyes are really good, you can't read that, you know, is not credit cards. It's, it's family. Right? So what that specifically reads is money, borrow from, or ask family. So think about this as a hierarchy. The first thing you do is you go to the bank. Do I have money in the bank? No. The next thing you do is you call up your family. You say, hey, you got money. This is not just about members of your church. This is a nationally representative sample. The next thing is work more hours. The next thing is credit cards. The next thing is sell assets. The next thing is borrow from or ask friends. This is a curious list in a curious order. But if you think about it, um, what I'm trying to do as an economist is get my fellow economists to realize that there's more to the world than simply the amount of money you have in a savings account and your credit line on a credit card. That in essence, people are coping with a variety of mechanisms. And that there are sociological solutions, which is friends and family, kin networks. There's labor solutions, which is working more. Um, there's product market solutions, which is selling your stuff. Um, and it's all uh, kind of related. Yes? Right, right. So we can slice and dice this about whether they have it. I mean, obviously, you can't borrow it if you don't have it in there. And we have done a lot of slicing and dicing. Um, the bottom bars are drawing things into buckets. So all savings, all friends and family, all borrowing. And so if you put all the savings stuff together, any savings mechanism, 58%, any friend or family, 32 any borrowing, 29 So you can kind of get a sense of, of how this waterfall was working. And you might say, how does that compare to other countries? Right? I told you, in general, we're <laughs> less able to cope than other countries. But are our coping mechanisms very different than other countries? So these bars are similar to the ones you just saw. Savings, the second one is friends and family, the third one is debt, the fourth one is sell things, and the fifth thing is increased work effort. And so if you go over here to Italy, which has a very high savings rate, what you see is savings is dominating the other mechanisms for coping. If you go over here to the United States, you'll see that we're much flatter. Right? Because since we have a lower savings rate, we have to rely on all these other mechanisms in order to cope with emergencies. And it varies. You know, France, again, higher savings <coughs> rate. Canada, higher savings rate. You can kind of see that you know, some of the differences between countries. Yes? Is that more, are we sharing more of choice not to put our money in the savings in the United States or circumstance? I'm not sure I know what the difference between choice and circumstance is. Things are more expensive here, we cost of have, living? Right. We don't have money to put in the savings, or we choose not. I, would, I feel like we choose not. I think there is a chunk of that. Because for example, um, we slice this by income. So between pe for people who make between $100,000 and $125,000 a year, a quarter of them claim that they can't come up with $2,000 in a month. It's hard to believe that that's not an element of choice. And you'd say, how can that be? Well, just do the, just kind of the mental experiment. So you make about that much money. You have a big mortgage. You have a couple of daycare bills. Um, suddenly, you might not have a lot of free cash. Those are choices you've made. So it is also true that you know, income inequality is, is steeper here than in other countries. So again, that, can be, that could be studied as well. Does it matter? So then we were trying to figure out, you know, the questions like, can I come up with $2,000? Did they affect any decisions that people make? So in a related paper, we look at how people changed their usage of health care in, in the recent crisis. And so the specific question is, have you increased, decreased, or, or kept the same? Your, uh, we call it routine health care, but the language that we use in the paper is really about um, 
We don't say preventative because that would cue them to say that they have to do it. Basically, routine and non-emergency care. And so what you're seeing is by country, what fraction of the folks in that country said they reduced care in the economic crisis, kept it the same, or increased it? And then in the fourth column, it says net change. So here we are in the United States, 26% of Americans said, yeah, I, I cut back on my usage of routine health care. 7% um, said they were to increase it. The net change is net, net, about 20% of Americans cut back on health care usage in the year following the economic crisis. Compare that with that net number of 20 with France, Germany, Canada, and Great Britain, and you can see what the health care debate is all about. In those universal health care systems, the degree of cutback on routine health care, you know, when the economy went south, was much, much less pronounced. You know, just look at the order of magnitude. We're three times as big as France, you know, probably six, to six times as big as Germany. Uh, there was no net cutback in health care in Canada at all uh, in the economic crisis. Well, does it relate to how much money you have? So what this is all about is the percent reducing care. So let's, let's start over here on the left. And this is the percent reducing care is the light one, and the net percent reducing care is the dark one. This is I certainly can raise 2,000. I probably can raise 2,000. I probably can't. I certainly can't. So what you're seeing here, and we've done this in multivariate analysis as well, is that cutbacks in care are quite strongly related to your ability to come up with emergency funds. It's also related to unemployment, and it's also related to wealth losses. So the decisions about whether to go to the doctor are, are pretty intimately related to whether you have this little buffer of money. And remember, the first place this buffer comes from is savings. Well, that's fine. So you don't go to the doctor for your checkup, but you know, so what? That's not a big life decision. So let's look at life decisions now. This is hard to read, and, and I apologize for that. But what we also ask people about is decisions about marrying, divorce, having children, going back to school, changing jobs, and retiring. And we controlled for gender, region, age, education, household composition, marital status, race, ethnicity, income, wealth, changes in wealth, financial planning uh, measures, financial education and gambling behavior. Control for all that. We want to know whether the answer to the simple question, can you come up with $2,000 in 30 days, gives us any insight into their decisions about whether they're going to get married or have kids. And the answer is yes. So the likelihood of, of having a kid or being willing to get married or retiring are significantly related after controlling for all that other stuff with their answer to this stupid question. Now, it may just be that people who are nervous about the world and perceive that nervousness and say, yeah, I can't raise money, are nervous about these other lifetime commitments. But what we're seeing here is a relationship, a core relationship between a relatively trivial amount of money and decisions as important as whether to have a kid or get married. So I don't teach in a family life school, but I think you can see the common interest that we have here. Um, this little bit of money makes a big difference. So where does that all leave us? Because that's just, in some sense, the warm up. Well, here are some facts. These are urgent, important problems. We've got a receptive set of people in business and policy who are interested in knowing what to do here. These are great research opportunities, because there's, you know, there's tremendous amounts of data that are suddenly be being made available. And there's a local teaching vacuum. In my school and schools like mine, we're not talking about these issues. We're not teaching about these issues. So you put all those four things together, and you'd have to be a fool not to kind of do what I did, which is simply to get to work. <laughs> right? And furthermore, um, and I wouldn't normally make this comment in other venues, but I think it's OK here. I come from a different faith tradition. But my faith tradition believes in social justice. Um, I'm not sure what the language would be. Um, and this is an important set of topics, not just because it's economically important, but you know, I don't think that it's fair or right um, that you know, you know, folks get left out in the cold. So in addition to all that, I think it's, you know, we have a moral imperative to try to do something about this. So what to do? What to do? So what I want to describe now and spend most of my time talking about are not the diagnoses, but kind of interesting innovations. Um, 
three things. One is stimulating and supporting research. This is only going to be of interest to your faculty colleagues. We set up a, a, a working group, the Boston Area Household Finance Group, where we sampled folks from Harvard and MIT and Boston College, Boston University, the Boston Fed. We set up this NBR working group um, on household finance, again, to encourage junior researchers to do work in this field. We set up a little e-journal. Um, we set up a course. Um, which is not new in the world, but in top-tier business schools, I think it was the first household finance course that we're aware of, that I'm aware of. And mostly, it's about kind of a bunch of stuff about driving research to action. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the first two and most about the third. So how do you organize a course for Harvard MBAs and Harvard lawyers, Harvard JDs, to help them understand consumer finance? We're not trying to get them to understand how to manage their own lives. We're not setting them up to go off and to work as, as advisors, financial advisors. Um, these are people who, by and large, see themselves as the captains of industry um, and, who, you know, and advisors to, you know, to folks. And furthermore, given our kind of positioning, um, it was important for us to figure out an organizing principle that would work here for the course. So here's the organizing principle. If you think about all of household finance, there are four major, and then I'd add a fifth, primary function. Savings and investing, credit, payments, and risk. So you can think about, rather than talk about businesses or products, let's just think about functions. So for example, payments. Payments is the ability to pay for bills. So how many different institutions or products are involved in the payments function? What would be some examples of payments, businesses, or products? Utilities. OK. How else do you pay bills and services? How do you pay for goods and services? Checks, electronic, cash, credit cards, debit cards, PayPal, postal money orders, private money orders. Um, you just start to look at it. And the number of different institutions involved in the payment space, it's not just one set. It's not even just banks. And you look at you know, how many different ways can you get exposure to the S&P 500. You can buy the stocks. You can buy the mutual funds. You can buy the futures. You can buy the index-linked annuities. You can buy um, various structured products. You can go on. There are about 15 ways to buy exposure to the S&P 500. And so we'll, an organizing device that we have at our school is to say, rather than talk about products and institutions, let's talk about functions, which is a clear way to do things. And then on the other axis, let's think about three points of view, the household, the firm, and then the political economy. Let's start at the bottom and work our way up. So if you think about this, how does the household think about savings and investing? How does the political economy think about credit? You can start to understand that we're trying to train students who are mindful of what households do, but they're going to run firms and they're going to run governments. So for example, under households, they have to understand economics, Budgets, for example, I suspect that you probably do some work to try to help students learn about budgets, but also psychology and sociology. So I want to give you a flavor for that. And this is, comes from research, but you know, I think you'll get a, a sense of it. Um, this is kind of an everyday debt literacy question. Um, suppose you owe $1,000 in your credit card, and the interest rate you were charged is 20% per year, compounded annually. If you didn't pay anything off at this interest rate, how many years would it take for the amount that you owe to double? All right. So let's see. We don't have our calculators with us. But forgetting compound interest, right? if 20% per year after five years you've doubled, with interest it's going to be under 5. So even without a calculator, you can kind of figure out it's going to be in the under 5 range. 5 to 10 or more than 10, you know, even without compounding, no way that's going to work. What fraction of Americans got this right? What do you think? 20%, 50 percent? 20? 80%? 36%? Now, the, and the next one you definitely can't read, but it's kind of fun. We look at you know, we analyze this as a function of a variety of things, age, gender, income, and a bunch of other factors. And at the bottom, we ask another question, which is, how much do you know, basically? And in most cases, people are self-aware. For example, 
Unfortunately, there's a gender difference between men and women. So up here, 46% of men got that question right, 25% of women got it right. And that's not acceptable, but it's just a fact for the moment. But men also believe that they are more kind of uh, financially literate than women. Similarly, if you look at this by income, you know, if you go from low to high, 26, 32, 39, 48, I think, percent got it right. And similarly, you know, in terms of their self-knowledge, it's 45, you know, 4.5, 4.9, 5.1, 5.2. So this is on a scale of seven. So people are self-aware, except for one group. There's one group up here that does really, really poorly, but also believes that they know more than anybody else. And it's senior citizens. So when you think about elder care issues, this is really dangerous. They think, look at that number. It's off the charts. It is the single highest average of any subpopulation that at least I'm showing you up here. They're judging themselves to be more knowledgeable about finance than anybody else. But they're among the lowest of any group. Why that's especially important is we are entrusting them to make a really important decision, which is you know, when they get to retirement, how do you spend down your retirement assets if you have them? Furthermore, research by my colleague David Lapson would suggest that you know, cognitive uh, impairment pre-dementia starts coming on quite early. So their, their ability to make these decisions starts to get compromised really early. So this is frightening to us that, you know, especially in light of the decisions they have to make, that the, the disconnect between what they know and what they think they know is so large. So if you wondered why you know, you're spending time on wondering about senior citizens' issues, um, and in fact, if you looked at the Dodd-Frank bill, one of the offices that was required to be set up under Dodd-Frank is an office for senior affairs. But it's more than just the numbers. It's a lot more than the numbers. Um, if you want to actually do business here, which is to run a firm or to kind of come up with new regulations, you have to go beyond economics and actually beyond that kind of just simple stuff that I've just shown. There's a technique that's been invented to try to get at uh, how people think about stuff, and it's called ZMET, the Zaltman Metaphor Elicitation Technique. Has anyone ever heard of that? Probably not. It's an interesting technique. Here's how it works. I ask you to come in, and I say, uh, I'd like you to bring in six images that make you think and feel about whatever, pantyhose, savings, uh, soft drinks, specific things. You bring in those six images, and a pr trained professional sits there and interviews you for two hours, one-on-one, -on -one, two hours, that's six pictures. And they first start to say, tell me about this picture. What do you see in this picture? Why did you bring it in? Uh, not why did you bring it in, what's in it? And then you make a collage here. And then you create a story about the picture. And basically the science behind this is that 90 plus percent of our images, 90 percent of the stuff that's stored in our brains is stored in the form of images and metaphors. And most of it we never unlock because we use words. So this just starts with the theory that says, in order to unlock how people feel, you've got to work with images, because that's how the brain is storing this information. Now, I thought that this was malarkey. <laughs> I'm an economist, um, business person. You know, the idea that somebody would like, do these little interviews, and two-hour interviews, and learn anything, I just thought was crazy, until I was invited to be a participant. And what I found was that I felt like somebody had ripped my head open <laughs> and had really, really uh, you know, compromised me in a way I had never thought. Now, I'm a professor. I can talk until you all fall asleep. I have so many canned little talks in my head, you know. But I found myself saying things about things I didn't even know I was thinking about. And we've used this technique to try to get at how people think about savings and money in general. And what you find out is pretty interesting. So I'm not going to show you a lot. I'm just going to show you one. This is a picture of how one person has visualized savings. So we have, we have scores of these. 
And for each one, we have two hours of, of, uh, of uh, transcript that goes along with it. And then you analyze all that. So this is one person's picture of savings. Any images up there that you find interesting? Think that's common or uncommon? It's extraordinarily common. Military images. So not everybody uses this. About half the American population uses imagery like this. Anybody want to guess which half it is? Men. This is a pretty classic image by a man about savings. Women, I don't have all the images here. Women's images are different. Typically, everybody's images have something to do aspirationally about the things that they're protecting or protecting against. Uh, often, water is a metaphor that works with money. Think about how many metaphors work with water and money. Can you think of any water money metaphors? Liquid assets flowing through your fingers. My money is frozen. Right? I'm drowning in debt. I mean, water and money, that metaphor is well known, which is why you often see blue in financial service ads. Um, so not uncommon, water here. But this image, very common. Very common. You have to understand what that image is about. It's about low-income people seeing that, that money and savings is something that they have to battle with. It's a fight. It's combat. And so advertisements that show a couple walking on the beach holding hands, uh-uh. This is not the image that most people are going to relate to when it comes to savings. We've done this for lots of different, or different populations. Um, or another image, when I say money and savings, you know, another image that comes up a lot is coupons. Coupons. Just think about that. Why would somebody bring in a picture of a coupon when we talk about savings, because we use the same word for saving money and savings, right? And in fact, until recently, it wasn't even cool to say you were saving, right? What word did we use until maybe 18 months ago if you were cool? You didn't say, I'm saving money. What did you say? I'm investing. Cool people invested. Uncool people saved. <laughs> and saved was stolen by merchants. Right? Think about it. Just, you know, when you have a cents off coupon and you save at the store, you should feel virtuous because you've just saved. No, you've spent less. But then you so it was the, the kind of confluence of these two words, a couple of people are smiling. They're getting it, right? You can see how I can market to you and make you feel like, oh, those Manolo Blotniks or whatever they're called, they're 20% off. Those are shoes for those of you who are men in the audience. Um, you know, that's not savings, or it's a different kind of saving than we're talking about, but people confused it. And then sometimes, here was the interesting one, there were pictures of lottery tickets. We asked people to bring in images of savings, and they brought in images of lottery tickets. What's that all about? And in fact, many people think about that as a way to save. So if we kind of had a structured interview and we had a, a survey, none of this would have come out. None of this would have come out. Or there were images of savings, and I don't have one right here, and the images were of vipers and vultures. You said, what's that all about? Who do you think they were, they were visualizing with the vultures and vipers? What do you think? Hmm? Could be risk, but they actually, they were images of people. Who are they, who were those standing in for? Well, you could think of that, but that's not who the images were about. It was their family. Because often they found that they got hit up by their family whenever they had money. So you'd look at this picture of a vulture and you'd think, oh, you're talking about banks. No. So it, it's, this is a very interesting technique. Um, it's a market research technique that is actually quite difficult to do because you really have to be trained. You have to be a therapist almost to, to carry this out. But the results that you get out of this are 
Um, they are really just incredibly uh, different than anything you'll ever see. And we need this kind of imagery because for the work that I'm about to show you, we need to understand emotion. And if you don't think that what we're talking about is deeply emotional, so we did one round where every single person that was interviewed broke down and cried. Everyone. Big, tall, black men. Didn't make a difference. Size, shape, gender. Everybody cried. Because we got them talking about their money, and boy, the tears just flowed. All right? This is, along with sex and religion, like one of those big topics um, that is, touches very close to the nerve. So our students, to go back to the students, they have to understand the economics, they have to understand psychology, sociology, and this kind of stuff. Because unless they understand this, not at an academic or a dry level, um, they'll never have a chance to build products, to build businesses, or to figure out how regulation works. Well, then at the firm level, this is kind of normal Harvard Business School stuff. Case studies on products and channels and economic models and competition and incentives. So for example, they may feel particularly badly about payday lenders, the people who are, frequent some of the stores outside your campus and in Salt Lake City that lend you money, $15 per hundred for two weeks. But until you understand their economics, it's hard to, to really criticize them all that much. And then we spend a lot of time thinking about the political economy which is what are the goals of regulation, what externalities give rise to those needs for regulation, um, what, how do things work, how do you increase social welfare. Um, so I ran a meeting about 18 months ago, and my colleague said, so Peter, is this another NATO meeting? I didn't know what he meant. NATO, North American Treaty Alliance Organization, I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, 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 a NATO meeting. No action talk only. <laughs> And so pushing past NATO, um, we do some interesting things at the school, but that's research. How do you turn it into practice? That's what we do at the nonprofit that I run, which is Doorways to Dreams. And I want to talk about two agendas in the last 15 minutes, financial skills and savings opportunities. So teaching f basic financial skills. Um, I can document, show you tons of studies that show that we don't know anything. By and large, Americans are abysmally trained in terms of financial. Um, I can show you a lot of other studies which are not very heartening that, you know, if you look at traditional financial education, um, there are at best mixed results. And so, could we come up with a new model? And so, think of the word education, that makes you really excited, right? It makes you want to go, well, actually, you're all earnest, that probably does work here, but, um, but we wanted to try to break the mold a little bit. So instead of talking about financial education, we talk about financial entertainment. <laughs> because to reach your demographic and my demographic, um, we're much better off, unless we could force people to go through a program, to do something that they'll find engaging. So what do I mean by financial entertainment? I mean actually delivering financial stuff in packages that people actually like. So what we've started with is casual games. I said, games? Like games? Really? No. 72% um, of Americans play video games. The rates of play are highest among those under the age of 35. But casual video games are the fastest growing segment in the game industry, and the, it's dominated by female players. Our target audience is women between the ages of 18 and 35, and they are game players. No, they don't play Myst and Halo, Grand Theft Auto. They don't play any of those games. They play Bejeweled. They play Diner Dash. They play, again, I caught a couple of smiles. At least you know what I'm talking about, right? They play the card games, right? They are, that is the market. We want to reach women. I, I get a couple of smiles. So our first game was Celebrity Calamity. You can kind of guess from the title what it's all about. You've been hired as the financial manager of a celebrity who's completely screwed up, right? Now, our first version of this game, they were a little too recognizable. Our lawyers made us get rid of the Lindsay Lohan and, and, and uh, other one lookalikes, and they're now a little bit more generic. But basically, you have to manage their financial life. And they mess up royally, and you have to kind of make it whole. Um, you can see how that would be kind of fun and playable. Um, this is our target audience. This is our test population. Um, and you can see who they are. They're kind of young women usually of color, 
Um, many of them are single mothers, but not all. I mean, this is our testing population. And here are some test results. Now, these are preliminary test results. This is like knowledge of APR, knowledge of finance charges. And if you look up here, we're actually doing pretty well. <laughs> There's a pretty substantial increase. Now, we talked about metrics. This isn't the best metric of effectiveness. But you know, the initial indications of these metrics are really quite good. We're increasing knowledge and awareness. And the most important metric, maybe not most, but one of the most important metrics is these games should be relatively fun to play. My daughter, who's now 20 at the time that we rolled the first one of these out, was 18, um, or 19, I suppose. Um, and I caught her playing this for fun instead of doing her homework. Right? That is a metric to success, right? to get somebody who's willing to do this for fun. So we have now said, you know, there's more of these that we can do. So we've created www.financialentertainment.org. And so you will find up there now Groove Nation, which is the first dance budgeting game in the country. Um, and we are shameless in being popular cultures. So you think you can dance, 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 revolution. You know, dance is a big deal right now. And so Groove Nation is dance and budgeting. Our second title, which is about to come out, is Farm Blitz, our second new title. Farmville, anybody know who Farmville is? Maybe a couple of people know Farmville. Farmville is an extraordinarily popular social media game right now. And Farm Blitz is a takeoff on Farmville where you actually have to manage your farm. And the one that I don't think I'm supposed to show, but I'll just show you anyway, because uh, I don't think anybody's seen this outside of our shop, it's called Bike Club. <laughs> anybody have a guess what that might be about? <laughs> it's a vampire game. <laughs> you manage a bar and vampires come in. And again, all this is about money management. So that's finding different venues that people can learn about, study, and practice money management in slightly more engaging and fun contexts. So we'll have another. These, these will all be out by the end of 2010. We'll probably have another four in 2011. Um, it's shameless, right? This is popular culture. We think that in order to actually have progress to meet, reach millions of people, again, young adults, um, we can't sit them down and force them to study this stuff. You know, we can force you to study stuff because you're in school. But once you're gone, it's a, you know, maybe your church can get you to do stuff. But in the broader population, we have to go where the people are. And this is where they are. So uh, we're also talking about some reality TV shows and some other things. So in, in kind of rapid fire, if that's an, an approach to financial education that we're doing, what are we going to do about the savings? Savings is a big problem. If you think about the different ways to encourage people to save, here's a continuum. Force them to save, Social Security. You have no choice but to put money into Social Security. Make it hard for them not to save. Really great work by uh, you know, a BYU alumnus, Bridget Madrian, who's a fellow at the Wheatley Institute, institution. Um, and it kind of defaults into pensions. Make it easy for them to save, bribe them to save. Economists love to bribe people. It's called financial incentives. Social support makes savings fun and exciting. The last one, you've got to make savings fun and exciting. Can't happen. Can't be done. So I'll inscribe two initiatives. And I'm going to start with this one, because it's really challenging. OK, quick poll. What's more exciting? I come from Massachusetts. What does the average person in Massachusetts spend per year on lottery tickets? And let me be more precise. Take total lottery sales in Massachusetts, divide by total population. So this isn't conditional on buying a ticket, how much do they spend? Total sales divided by total population. Right? That's all it is. Every man, woman, and child in my state. Right? We're going to do the hands up thing again. Right? And then I'm going to, I want you to drop your hand when you think we get to the point where it's equal to the average lottery sales per year in Massachusetts per person. So everybody's hands up. Right? So when you think I get high enough, put your hand down. Um, 25 bucks a year. 50. 100. 150. 200. 300. 400. 500. 600. 700. The answer is $725. $725 a year per person in Massachusetts on lottery tickets. The national average is $540 per family. But that includes just taking total lottery sales by total population. And you don't have a lottery in the state, so that includes 
all of you, but you're all buying zero unless you're kind of going over state borders or buying Powerball or something like that. So can you leverage this? Turns out you can. Been doing it for hundred, hundreds of years. So this is a product in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, it's offered by the government. It's called premium bonds. So this is like buying a savings bond from the British government, except premium bonds are a little different because they don't pay any interest. Well, who'd be stupid enough to buy them? It's all about this. Every month, there's two one million jackpots, as well as 100,000 other little prizes. Here's how it works. Everybody puts their money in. It generates interest, which is called a prize pool. And the prize pool, the rate on the prize pool is roughly the interest rate that, in aggregate, you should expect to earn as a group. And then it's allocated. So not everybody doesn't get interest that's proportional to their balances. They get a chance of winning that's proportional to their balances. In the end, all we're doing is basically we're paying a fair rate of interest, but we're just divvying up the interest. And by the way, our principal is never a risk. Take your money out at any time. This product has existed since 1956. It is remarkably successful. Um, and, it, it, and, and this kind of product is offered in lots of countries, about 18 or 19 countries all around the globe. It's unfortunately illegal in the United States because, um, well, first of all, lotteries pro are prohibited. Private lotteries are prohibited. And banks aren't allowed to play with lotteries. So we came up with a way to do this. You'll find a theme in this is that we break the law. Not quite. Um, we actually found a loophole in Michigan that allowed us to offer this uh, in conjunction with a number of uh, credit unions, eight credit unions, um, into very poor areas in Michigan. And we started um, Save to Win. In January of 2009, we ran through December of 2009. Um, we opened about 12,000 accounts, $9 million, um, relatively people with very little wealth, people with relatively little income. 66% report not having a regular savings plan. 59% said they spent money in the lottery in the last six months. <laughs> All right. this, is, this product is actually going to where we want to go to, low to moderate income people who don't save. And, and this year, um, this Save to Win program, um, instead of it being eight credit unions, I think we're up to 40 credit unions. Um, we had an FDIC subcommittee meeting on this. And, um, they looked at it in the summer of 2009, so kind of a little wind to our backs. We passed legislation in Maryland and Rhode Island to enable this. We're working with a major state lottery and a gubernatorial candidate on this savings product. We've identified a large financial institution that's willing to test this. We think that this concept will sell like hotcakes, right? Because we're going where consumers are. Remember, 700 bucks per person in Massachusetts on lottery tickets. Wouldn't it be nice if some of that money were saved? give people the choice of either saving money or buying a lottery ticket. By the way, we're told that about 40% of lottery tickets are sold as gifts. right? Um, and maybe this doesn't happen among your population, but it is very common at Christmas time and birthdays to give people lottery tickets. Um, we'd much rather a kid get a save to win account than a lottery ticket. Here, here in Michigan, did you notice, uh, was there a reduction we were too small to really have an impact. We were only in eight credit unions. And, yeah. So yeah. Did, you didn't ask the people whether they? No. We didn't. Right. In some sense, we didn't want the answer, because we didn't want to get shut down. All right, so I'll do one more, and then I think I'm going to be out of time. Supporting savings. Um, about $300 billion, $250 billion in refunds are given out by the federal government, and banks aren't really interested. So where should this money go? Well, we found that. And again, I'll make it quick. Um, banks, as I said, didn't want their money. But what people wanted were small denominations, low risk, portable, liquid, brand name, widely available funds. Um, and so we asked a simple question. If somehow we let people, when they got their refunds, immediately buy that product, would they save? And, but what is that product? We'd have to create it from scratch. And that's way too expensive. We found the product on the shelf. And it looks like this. Anybody own one of these? U.S. savings bond? Anybody get a savings bond at baptisms, communions, birthdays? Any, a couple of people. Great instrument. You should study these. Series I savings bonds, inflation index. So what we did is we did a simple thing. We simply said, when you get your refund, we'll, buy, we'll sell you a savings bond. And we did this over four years. We did it in Schaumburg, Illinois. I wrote papers. We did it in Boston and, and other places. I wrote more papers. We did it in a bunch of VITA sites, voluntary income tax sites wrote more papers. 
Um, this was kind of fun. Um, the Treasury shut us down. They said, you're in violation of uh, federal law. That was really a bummer. And there was only way, one way to get around this, all right, because we did our research. The only way to get around this was for the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Paulson, to sign an order that said we were OK. In order to do that, we had to get the IRS, the Bureau of Public Debt, and the Department of Treasury, and the Financial Management Service to all sign off. We got that within three months. We kept doing this, um, testing and testing and testing and, and creating data um, over a long period of time. And all the data was pretty consistent. Um, these man numbers may not look like a lot, 6 to 9% take-up rates. They're actually pretty good, mostly by women and parents, low-income folks, savings by new savers who didn't plan to save substantially for their kids. Right? So somehow we put this product in front of the right people at the right time, and we were generating pretty substantial savings. So we had a real strong policy recommendation, which is you should really make this easy. And we were delighted, delighted when last Labor Day, President Obama Second, said this. We'll make it easier for people to save their federal tax refunds, which 100 million families receive. Today, if you have a retirement account, you can have your refund deposited directly into your account. With this change, we'll make it easier for those without retirement plans to save their refunds as well. Then he says, You'll be able to check a box on your tax return to receive your refund as a savings bond. So four years of research, and the policy implications are pretty straightforward. We are now able to make every American um, basically have access to savings vehicles at tax time. That's $100 billion of low-income folks' money. So um, I think I'm just about out of time, so I want to close up here. The whole idea here is that you know, this combination of really understanding your customer and then understanding these businesses and public policy can lead to this kind of systemic change, to have you know, kind of save to win work, to have this work at a much higher level. Um, we're now in intimate discussions with the Treasury and the IRS and FMS to make sure that every American knows about this option. Um, so if you want to move the needle on savings, how do you do that? We found that it's particularly effective to shoot for these high, kind of high profile systemic changes in, in policy and business. So I think I'm at the end of about an hour. What I wanted to give you a sense was if you're studying kind of families and economics and you're feeling like, oh, where does that lead? Um, how does it fit into the big picture? How do I relate what I'm doing on the ground to stuff that President Obama and Secretary Geithner are doing? The link is very direct. So I encourage you to keep doing that. For those of you in economics, um, you'd say, well, you know, this stuff, this isn't traditional economics. I'd encourage you that this is about as traditional economics as you can get. Um, this is a tremendous um, place to do tr interesting research that will have an impact on the world. So I think at that point I will kind of call it quits, but I'm not running away, so if you have questions, I'll stay up here and be happy to answer any. All right, thank you all for coming.